Again, that's Luke chapter 24. Good to see all of you here. Good to see Annika, Annika and Kayla back. We're so glad to see them. Praise the Lord. Missed, missed you guys. So, amen. Now, in Luke chapter 24, we're still so close to the events of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the epicenter of the gospel is that our God lives. We serve a risen Savior. And um, he came out of that grave, walked out of that grave, and hopefully he will have your invitation to walk into your heart because that's where he wants to reside is with you and in you. And he's just waiting for your invitation to come into your life and to meet every need of your life. You have emotional needs, you have physical needs, you have spiritual needs, and God is able to meet all of those needs. He just waits for your invite to come in to your life. And hopefully, he'll receive that today. That's, uh, that's what we're praying for. Now, in Luke, then chapter uh, 24, and there is the second part of verse 5, this question, why seek ye the living? among the dead. That's a good question. Because a lot of people are going out to the dead and from the dead they're seeking life. And God asks, why are you doing that? If you want life, you're not going to find it from the dead. But here's where you can find it. Listen to these words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. What did God just say? Well, to those who want more than just an existence, you know, my heart's beating, my lungs are breathing. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know where I came from. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing while I'm here. I'm just existing. Would someone help me to figure out what this thing called life is all about? Well, the person who can do that is Jesus. And he's just waiting for that invitation to come into your life. He is life. And he will explain life. He's got all the answers. But the question, why seek ye the living among the dead? This is where most people are trying to find life from the dead. It's not going to work. Never has, never will. So, and the good news, verse number six, he is not here. He is not here. But is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? That time before his death? Remember? Verse 7, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered, must be delivered into the hands of sinful men to be crucified. And the third day rise again. Well, mark your place, but if you're able, look with me at Hebrews chapter 2. Must be crucified. And that's Hebrews chapter 2. And verse 9. I'll read verse 14 and 15, but let's begin in verse number 9 of Hebrews chapter 2. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels 
for the suffering of death. He must be crucified. Crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Verse 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him, referring to the devil, that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Can you imagine living all of your life fearing death? And that fear literally controlling every aspect of your life, afraid of everything because you're afraid of death a slave to fear. And so, yes, yes, he was crucified and uh, for tasted death for every man. I'm back in Luke chapter number 24 and uh, verse number 8. And so they remembered his words. So the implication of that statement is they had forgotten. They had forgotten. And that brings us to the question, why had they forgotten? Verse number nine. And returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven. Remember one, Judas Iscariot is now dead. He hanged himself, committed suicide after selling Jesus for the silver, and uh, now there are 11. At this time, there are just 11. And so these who have witnessed the empty, empty sepulcher, the empty grave, the message of the angels, he is risen, they are now taking this message to the 11, the 11 disciples, and, and to all the rest, there were many others. In verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. Now watch this, verse 11, and their response to the good news, these 11 who had just spent three years with Jesus, eyewitnesses to his miracles, look at their response to the good news that he has risen, in verse number, uh, verse 11. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. <laughs> oh, wow, they believed them not. What is it they're not believing? Well, Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 explains what it is they're not believing. These are 11 men that have walked with Jesus, been eyewitnesses to his miracles for three years, and they've made the decision to not believe. Look at this in Romans chapter 10. In verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth 
the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So all of these followers of Jesus are bringing this wonderful good news to these 11 men and their response, they believed them not. Now, what does God do at such a time as we need restoration of faith? And that's what we're going to look at here. But uh, some other commentary that is pertinent to this passage in Mark chapter 12. And so let's go to Mark chapter 12. We'll look at verses 26 and 27. Uh, how incredible, how incredible is this that you can spend three years with God on earth, witness all of his miracles, witness God saving lost souls, and end up in such a spiritual state that you, you don't believe. I mean, how does, that, how does that happen? And how does God restore faith? And, and how, how is he going to accomplish the restoration of their faith? And how is God going to bring us to greater faith or restore our faith? Well, that's what we're going to find out. But let's look at Mark 12 and verse number 26 and 27. And as touching the dead, that they rise. Yeah. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Praise God. He's the God of the living. Because the dead rise. They rise, Jesus says. And then, speaking of resurrection, look at the Gospel of John, chapter 5. The Gospel of John, chapter 5. Now here we'll look at, and you're very close to that, John 5, verse 28 and 29. While we're on the subject of resurrection, John, chapter 5, so we'll look at verse number 28 and 29. John 5, 28. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And you know the hour is coming. And I think we're very near that hour. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. Now that's referring to those that know Jesus, have accepted Jesus, trusting, believing in him for the salvation of their soul, the forgiveness of their sins. They'll be resurrected, resurrection of life, but and they that, have, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's death and hell. And so, yes, the resurrection of those who have died in Christ and the resurrection of those who died having re rejected Jesus Christ. Oh, oh yes. And... Uh, Depending on 
their decision about Jesus Christ will determine their eternal, their eternal state. Heaven or hell? The resurrection. Wow. Now notice in uh, our text of Luke chapter 24 and as we uh, proceed and, and so what is, I mean, can you believe it? These 11 men, they've just heard a report from all of these women about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the empty tomb, the report of the angels, and they're sharing this with the 11, and their response is they... Uh, they believe them not. They believe them not. Wow. What's God, what's he going to do about that? Uh, uh, verse 12, then arose Peter. So Peter listens to the women, and he ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothed laid by themselves. What does that mean? There's no body. There, there's the linen that once was wrapped around the body, but no body. And uh, he departed, wandering in himself at that which was come to pass. And verse number 13, a seven-mile walk. Seven-mile walk. And uh, behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs, and that's about seven miles. And that's a pretty good walk. And uh, so these who had been followers of Jesus, they're walking, they're talking together of all these things which had happened, talking about the uh, trial, the mocking, the scourging, the torture, uh, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, talking about it all as they walk along these seven miles to Emmaus. And uh, it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, who drew near? See, what we're looking at is when we're at a low ebb in faith. Um, when something happens in our life or lives, in, in the lives of those who, who know Jesus, but it's, it's catastrophic, it's, it's crisis, it's, and it just, it just brings us to, the, to uh, a place where we're struggling, we're struggling in our faith, our belief. I mean, right, you know, when everything's humming along nicely, right? It's the way we all, we all like life to be. It's the way we all want life to be, right? Everything just always going good, always going great. But who doesn't want a life like that? But what happens when um, that's not happening? What happens when um, everything is turned upside down? What happens when our hopes and our dreams are shattered? What, what happens when, you know, wow, this... This isn't going at all like I thought it was going to go. I mean, I never thought 
I'd be in this situation. I never thought I'd be in this condition. I mean, hey, when I trusted and believed in Jesus, well, I thought everything was always going to be good and great because when Jesus came into my life, well, that was the greatest moment of my life. I was happy. I mean, uh, uh, and, and, now, and now, look what's happening now. They don't even believe. They believe not. God is not a liar. He is the truth. And he speaks truth. And God doesn't lie. I mean, God told them he would rise again from the dead. You know, and this, this point between God giving a promise and God fulfilling a promise is called what? It's called faith. God gave him the promise. They had forgotten, but then they remembered. And uh, so they're... They're struggling. Oh, they're struggling big time. Because, uh, I mean, this is not the way, this is not the way that I thought life was going to go. This is not the way that I thought, you know, it was going to, to be. And now, I'm not even sure I trust and believe anymore. I mean, so... So who comes along in verse number 15? Yeah, Jesus himself. Would you look at that? Who's going to come along when your world gets turned upside down? Who's going to come along when the bottom falls out of your life? Who's going to come along when it just didn't go the way you thought it was going to go. Is anybody going to come along? You know, the psalmist said, no man cared for my soul. Right? Everybody, everybody's got enough problems of their own to take on your problems. That's, that's the world we live in. No man cared for my soul. But there is one who cares. There is one who cares. And his name is Jesus. And there he is. And there he is. Now, um, you know, mark your place, but we're going to look at a, you know, so. Um, so we're going to look at a few, uh, a few scriptures here. Um, and uh, so I, I want you to see, I want you to see what happens when a believer makes the decision to stop believing. Okay? Well, it's a good thing that when you get saved, God gave you that saving faith. That's not, that's not you. It's God giving you saving faith. That's a, that's a, a very good thing. That no aspect of your salvation depends on you. It's all God. And when you're running low on faith, God knows just exactly what to do about it. Now, here are the consequences that always accompany uh, choosing unbelief. Okay, uh, But their eyes were holding. Their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Unbelief blinds our spiritual eyes. It blinds us. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Wow. Um, let's, uh, 
let's look at uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter three. Now these are troubled souls. This is not a this is not a happy walk and talk. These are very troubled people as they walk and talk. And uh, so we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 3. And, uh, and so verse, they're very disturbed, very upset. And that is a consequence of choosing unbelief. Because look at what God says, Hebrews 3, 18 and 19. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? Uh, at what point do we leave our rest in Jesus? our peace, our calm, our rest. Well, the moment you make the choice, the decision to stop believing. Look at it. Uh, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And that is a consequence of making the decision of unbelief. Now, and watch this, a second consequence. So you lose your rest, you're troubled, you're disturbed, because you, you know, you've made the decision. And they made their decision. They believed them not. Look at verse 17 of our text in Luke 24. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these? that ye have one to another. He says, why are you talking like this? Um, he's concerned by what he hears. And what he hears stems from their unbelief. And what he hears is, is concerning him. And so he asks them, why are you talking like this? Well, they're talking like that because in their heart they are making a decision to stop believing. As ye walk and are what? What emotional state does he find them in? Another word is depressed. They're down in the dumps. So another consequence of making the decision to stop believing is it's going to affect you emotionally. Huh. I, I just couldn't believe, I could not believe my eyes. I read, I read about a, a young woman in Europe who is tired of being sad and depressed. She's healthy, but she's just tired of being sad and depressed. And in Europe, in some of those nations in the European Union, if you decide you, you want your life to, to be ended, they will medically end your life. She's healthy, she's a young woman, but she's just decided, I'm tired of being sad. I'm tired of being depressed. And so um, they're going to end her life. These men have made the conscious decision to stop believing. And what condition do we, does Jesus find them in? They're sad. You know, that's the way it works. If we, if I, if you, as, as we go through times in life that we just don't understand, we just don't get it, it's like, you know, they witnessed the death of Jesus. They had pinned all of their hopes on Jesus. They had trusted and believed in every promise he gave them. And now he's, in their mind, 
dead and in the grave. Never mind the fact that he told them he was going to rise again, which they had forgotten, but, you know. And um, they're sad. They're sad. Look at Psalm chapter 3 and verse 3, if you would, please. Psalm chapter 3 and verse 3. We'll look at a few verses here. Now, this is our God. This is our Savior speaking, and this is what he does. It's what he, it's what he can do. It's what he will do when he finds our faith faltering. Okay? Uh, as we go through, you know, as we go through uh, times in life that we just, we don't get it, we don't understand it, we, it's just like, you know, why is this happening? Um, Psalm 3, verse 3, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the what? Class, what church? See, see there. See the picture here. Your head's hanging down, and God knows how to lift up your head. See, but look at Psalm thirty-four and verse eighteen, if you would. You're not far from that. Psalm thirty-four and verse number eighteen. And look at this. Now, they, I mean, these guys, these men, I mean, their hearts are broken. You know, see, sadness is reflective of a broken heart. And this is our God. Look at this. And Jesus walks right up to them. The Lord is what? It means, yeah, near, nigh, near. I mean, you can't get much closer than walking right up next to you. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Contrite spirit means you're being honest with God about everything. If you've done wrong, you own up to it. If you're living in sin, you admit it. Contrite. It's the opposite of prideful. It's humble. And you just get right with God. You just come clean with God about everything. You just, I mean, he already knows the truth. Why, 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 try to, why try to lie to God? He already knows the truth, you know. He just wants you to get honest, get right with him. Stop trying to bluff your way through life and stop being a fake and a phony. Just be real with him. Um, yeah, I mean, so many people are so busy trying to uh, um, make other people think well of them, they forget to just be honest with God about the truth. Because God already knows the truth. You, you just Psalm 147 and verse 3. Let's see what we can find there in Psalm 147 and uh, verse number 3. Three. So, all right, Psalm 147 and verse number three. Look at this. What does our God do? He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Well, I understand. I understand getting physically wounded, right? But did you know your soul can be wounded? There, there's a part of your being, it's called the soul. And, uh, you know, we all understand physical wounds. But your soul can be wounded, and he's the healer. Why is Jesus, what is he going to do here? He's walked up on him here. He's walked up on him here. Well, this is what he's going to do. He's going to heal him. Do you need?
need healing? Do, do you need your faith rekindled? See, your faith didn't come from your flesh. Your, any faith you've ever had came from God. Because if you could say, oh, well, it's my faith, then that means you did something. The only thing we've ever done is sin against God. That's the only thing we've ever done. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. But when you make the decision upon hearing that Jesus died for you, that he was buried, he died to pay for your sins against God, mine, the sins of the world. He was buried as proof that he died because that is the penalty God placed on sin. It is the death penalty. And you invite Jesus Christ. He brings you the faith. He brings you the salvation. He brings you everything. It's all him. It's all him and none of us. It's all him. To God be all the glory. He gets all the glory. He gets all the credit. It's all very humbling, I know. <laughs> but there it is in uh, yeah, Luke 24, and verse 18. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, <laughs> he's talking to Jesus. He doesn't realize it. He doesn't realize it because he's been blinded by unbelief. He's in a very sad, he's in a very sad uh, emotional state. Art, art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? It's like, are you kidding me? You, are you, are you really clueless? You, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Are, are you the only one that doesn't know what's going on? He's telling Jesus this. Yeah, I think Jesus does know. Yeah, I think he knows all too well what's been going on in Jerusalem. <laughs> he was at the very center of it all, but he lets Cleopas talk. And in verse 19, and he said unto them, What things? Isn't that interesting how he answers? He, you know, he could have he could have explained it all, but he's drawing it out. He's drawing it out of them. What things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Now, I want you to see the tensing. Because the tensing reveals their heart condition. Do you see it in verse 19, which was a prophet? So what did they just tell Jesus by the by the use of the, instead of saying, which is a prophet, mighty indeed, they said, which was. So what are they saying to Jesus by the use of the word was? He, remember, who's talking to them? And so they're saying to Jesus, they don't know it's Jesus, but they're, they're saying, you're dead. That's what they're telling Jesus, you're dead. Yeah. Wow. And uh, how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and, to ha and have crucified him. And then, again, I want you to look at the tensing of verse number 21. But we did what? You know, they could have said, we trust. But what did they say? We trusted. You know what they're saying? Two things are telling Jesus who is walking with them. Number one, you're dead. And number two, we used to trust in Jesus. This is the way life goes when a believer makes the decision to stop believing, to stop believing. We're dealing with depression. We're dealing with sadness. We're de dealing with spiritual blindness. We're dealing. We're dealing with um, believe with thinking with thinking things that are totally deviant of Scripture. 
See, a lot happens when, when we make the decision to stop believing. Now, God gave that faith. You better cherish that faith. You better keep the faith. The Bible says keep the faith. Yeah, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Do you realize what they just told Jesus? <laughs> God, you're not doing your part. It's the third day. Now, they've made the decision to stop believing. He's right there walking with them, but they can't even see him. Their eyes are holding. Uh, you know, look, they're going through a, a crisis. I'll give them that. Someone said it's not, it's not what happens to you, it's how you respond to it. And their response is, we don't believe. How are you responding to what's happened in your life? Well, this is how they responded. We don't believe. Huh. Now look at this, if you would, please. I mean... You know, this brings me back to the question, what is God going to do about this? What is, how is he going to restore the faith? <laughs> These guys are in trouble. And you know what? If, if we're not careful, we can all get in trouble too. How fast can we get in trouble? Well, the day before, one day before, or pardon me, it'd be... Four days, four days earlier, they're not in trouble. And now, these few days later, they're in trouble. Huh. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, if you would please. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and... Um, Second Corinthians, and I think I said chapter 1 and verse number 20. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For how many of the promises of God, church? Oh, all. For all the promises of God in him, referring to Jesus, are yea. And in him, amen. The word amen means trustworthy unto the glory of God by us. And so as we choose faith instead of unbelief, we glorify God. Now, when we come under attack, what part of the spiritual armor did God command us to raise? Well, let's look at it. It's in... Uh, I want to say Ephesians chapter, what, chapter 6. And you're right, it's Ephesians chapter 6 and uh, verse 16. What is the devil, the liar, the deceiver telling these, uh, these disciples? <laughs> Your God's dead! As they walk along. Because who else is there? Who else is there on their seven mile walk? Whispering into their mind. Doubt. Fear and unbelief. Who's giving them that message? Jesus is walking with them. But who else is walking with them? The devil himself. 
Look at this, if you would, please. Uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 16. Above all, above, above all, more important than all of the other spiritual armor, this is above all the rest, above all, taking the shield of what? The shield of faith. Wherewith ye shall be able to do what? Quench, it means put out, extinguish. How many of the fiery darts of the devil? All of them. All of them. I mean, the devil is just working them over. Because what is the one thing the devil does not want them doing beyond the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? The one thing he doesn't want the disciples to do is what? To be a witness for Jesus Christ. Because if they stop believing, they'll stop witnessing. So there's a great spiritual battle going on. Um, now, look at Hebrews chapter 6, and if you would, Hebrews chapter 6, verse uh, 12. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. God's the one who gives us the faith. No, we, we don't muster the faith. No, no. Faith comes from God. But we decide what to do with it. And uh, right now, Boy, whew. they made a decision to not believe. Look at Hebrews 6 and verse 12. Hebrews 6 and verse number 12. Um, that, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience, that's endurance, inherit the promises. Verse 15 says... And so after he had patiently uh, endured, he obtained the promise. You're going through some trouble, going through a trial, you're going through a, you know, um, well, keep the faith. Keep the faith. It's, well, I don't understand. I don't understand. Well, that's why it's called faith. God understands. God knows what he's doing. And God knows everything the devil's doing. God's in on the throne. God's in control. He's in charge. Just keep the faith. And they said, but, you know, look at Hebrews 10, verse 35. Uh, we have one job as a child of God, and that is to believe God. That's our one job, believe God. God will do his work. He'll do his job. Hebrews 10, 35 through 39. Hebrews 10, 35. Cast not therefore away your what? Yeah. So, uh, you can... Cast away your confidence. That's what, that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. Um, wow. Which hath great recompense of reward. Keep, you keep the confidence. Keep, you keep that faith which God has given you. And there's great reward for you. For ye have need of patience. That means steadfastness, endurance. Don't quit. Don't give up that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. And I tell you, Jesus is coming. <laughs> wow. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Interestingly enough, that means those who are damned to hell. <laughs> perdition. 
But of them who believe to the what? To the saving of the soul. Yeah. Now let's, uh, we got to go back. Cause, uh, boy, we've got the fast clock on the wall today. Luke chapter 24, please, if you would. And um, but we trust. Well, I, w I wish it would say, but we trust. No, it says we trust him. Something we used to do. Um, yea, and verse 22, certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were here with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Jesus at this point, I, he's, he's had about all he can take. And look at verse 25. Then said he unto them, and how's, how, do, how does he refer to them? What does he call them? O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets have spoken, how long will it be ere they believe me? God asks. How long will it be ere they believe, until they believe me? Um, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now I want you to see what how Christ restores faith. Because it really is the only way to restore faith. Now watch this. Here is, here is how God restores faith. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he did what? What does that word expound mean? Teach. Yeah, explain. Unto them in, 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 from what did he expound or teach? All the scriptures the things concerning himself. So what is the antidote of the Lord Jesus Christ in their uh, condition or in our life when we come to a low ebb in faith? What is the answer? What is the remedy? What is the solution? Well, here it is. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And you know, are, are you running low on faith? Is your faith down? Well, uh, how am I going to know if my faith is down? Are you sad? Are you discouraged? Are you depressed? That was their condition when their faith was at a very low ebb. Nothing's changed. Got a young woman in Europe who's tired of being sad, physically healthy, in my life. Look at this, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. What does Jesus Christ do to increase their faith? Would you answer that, please? We just read it. What is he, what is he doing? He's teaching them what? God's word. He is 
quoting, he wrote the book. He is quoting his word to them. They're on a seven-mile walk. That's a lot of time to teach somebody. He is quoting scripture to them. And why is he doing that? Verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by what? How about that? All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. There is nothing that will profit you more than this book. Get into the book. Let the book get into you and watch your faith increase. The one thing Satan is out to destroy in your life is your faith. And so uh, they, as they drew nigh, verse 28, unto, I'm back in our text, Luke 24, 28, they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went, they finally get to the end of their seven-mile walk. Um, he made as though he would have gone further, Jesus does, but they constrained him, saying, the word constrained means they forced, pressured and compelled him to abide with us. For it is uh, toward evening, uh, and the day is far spent, and he went in to tarry with them. Is that the way we feel about Jesus? Do we relish our time with Jesus? I mean, you know, walking at a normal gait, three miles per hour, you that are proficient in math you're walking three miles an hour you're walking seven miles how long is your walk huh two and a half hours yeah they want more we we want more instead of instead of when is this gonna end is this service ever going to end? It's like, Lord, give us more. Give us more. And it came to pass, verse 30, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake. Again, the picture of his death by the broken body, the bread, and, and gave to them. I want you to see what happens because they've been for two and a half hours in the Word of God. They've been with the Word and they've been in the Word and the Word is now, you know, don't you wish you never had to go fill your gas tank up? Or I guess if you're in an EV, go plug in, whatever it is you do. Don't you wish you never had to do that? But you know if you don't get the refill, what's going to happen? You're going to be sitting somewhere. And I promise you this, you don't want to be sitting on the side of the freeway in Las Vegas, Nevada, anywhere. You don't want to be sitting on the side of a surface street in Las Vegas, Nevada, anywhere. You know. But if you don't, you, you understand what Jesus did for two and a half hours? He filled their soul. He gave them a fill-up. You know, every time we come here, that's what we should be coming here to do, is to get a fill-up. But if this is the only place you're filling up, you're going to run out somewhere out there. You ought to be filling up every single day. You ought to start your day with a fill-up. And you say, well, I, I'm going through something. I, I just don't feel like it. When you're going through trials and problems and that's when you need to fill up the most. Don't push away the very thing, the only thing that can help you. He gave him a fill up. And I want you to see what happened. And uh, verse 31 tells you what happened. 
What happened? Oh, they got a fill up, and now they can see things again the way it really is. Instead of the way the devil has been lying to them and discouraging them and depressing them and defeating them, they got to fill up, their eyes are open, and now I can see the way it really is. I'm no longer blind. That's why we pre preach the Word. That's why we teach the Word. That's why we encourage you to get into the Word. Because we're all going through assorted and various battles of life. My battle may not be what your battle is, and yours may not be what mine is, but one thing is for sure, we're all going through the battles of life. And the only way to make it is with a fill-up, a spiritual fill-up, and their eyes were open. And they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, oh, look at verse 32, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us? And what, and what was he talking into their soul? Two and a half hours, he's preaching the word of God to them. And they're saying, that book, that book, that book, the scriptures, the word of God, it, it brought me back to faith. It brought me back to life. It brought, brought me back to hope. It brought me back to peace. And I know that my God is going to take care of anything, of everything I'm going through. And uh, they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon and they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of Are you sure you're spending enough time? With God. Are you sure? Father, um, a timeless message for your people these 2,000 years later, and we're thankful. Our, our greatest need our greatest need is you, Lord Jesus. You are the living word. You are the written word. You are the word. And your words are life. Oh, God. How do you find us? How do you find us? Where are we spending our time? In the word? In the world, how do you, what is our uh, our the condition of our soul? Do you find us dejected? Do you find us discouraged? Do you find us sad, the way you found them? Or do you find us hopeful? Do you find us peaceful? Do you find us confident that? You're going to take care of whatever it is we're going through? How do you find us, Lord? Well, however you find us is reflective on what we've been doing with your word. God, help us. Help us not to leave this book sitting on the shelf. Unopened, untouched, unread. get that fill up because otherwise we're not going to make it in a way that honors and glorifies you yeah. God help us to rededicate our lives to the word of God and then to the work of God
and I'm praying for those souls who have never invited Jesus to come into their life. I'm praying that they would do so. Wherever they are, you would, you would hear them pray, Lord Jesus, please come into my life. Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all of my sins against you. And that you would, Lord, uh, receive their invitation for you to come into their heart and life today. Wherever in this world they are, <laughs> listening to the, uh, this message from the Word of God, we pray for precious souls to be saved. And we pray for those that are, who are really down. Um, life just hasn't gone the way that they thought it would go. And entertaining thoughts of just walking away from, from you. Lord Jesus, I pray you do what you did 2,000 years ago. And just give them a visit, Lord. And as they open your word, I pray you'd fill their hearts. And, uh, oh God, we think you're coming soon. And please uh, find us faithful in your work and your service when you do come. In Jesus' name, God bless your word. As we stand, the pianist plays God's invitation. God's invitation. Would you rededicate yourself to the word of God?